recording. Hello and good morning, everyone. Welcome to the What's Up Wednesday Game Schooling Using Board Games in the Classroom webinar. Today's webinar is co-sponsored by the Games and Gaming Roundtable of the American Library Association. And my name is George Bergstrom. I'm the Southwest Regional Coordinator from the Indiana State Library's Professional Development Office. I will be the host and question moderator today. Our presenter this morning is Catherine Croft, co-founder and CEO of Cat Lily Games. I'd like to start off the webinar with a few announcements. To register for other webinars or other trainings available from the Professional Development Office, please see the Indiana State Library's events calendar, which can be found on our website at www.in.gov library. This session is one hour, so you will get one LEU for today. If you're watching the archived recording of this webinar, the instructions on how to obtain your LEU certificate are available in the video's description on YouTube. Or you can find these instructions on the Indiana State Library's Continuing Education website under the LEU policies. Without further ado, I will now turn the presentation over to Catherine. Hi, uh, welcome everybody. I'm really excited to be here. This is my passion, board games and education, and I'm very happy to be able to share this with you my experiences and um, just like my tips and tricks for using it in um, the classroom. So, okay, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually a neuroscientist. I uh, went to undergraduate at Duke University and then I got my PhD in neuroscience at the University of Virginia. And then I worked at the National Institutes of Health for five years doing neuroscience research. Um, and then after that, I worked for three years at an autism nonprofit lab. So um, that was my background. And I had always wanted to be a professor, but like as the time got closer, I had my first baby and I never got to see my baby. So I was like, I need something different here. And I like I really just fell in love with teaching. I was always the one teaching people in the lab and going out to high schools and taking brains and things like that. Um, and so I kind of took the plunge and like did a little, um, for two years I worked in an after school science center where I developed curriculum for K through 12, actually preschool through 12. Um, and I like was in charge of all the life sciences. So biology, chemistry, anatomy, anything like that. And I found that games were the most effective way of teaching something boring or complicated in a short amount of time. So I would create little mini games for my classes. Um, and essentially I had a coworker who was an engineer turned teacher and he had started designing his own games and he actually brought in like a prototype that was like a paper prototype, but it was all sleeved. And I was just so impressed that someone had like made their own a prototype. I'd never seen that before. Um, and I, you know, I've been a lifelong lover of board games. So um, long story short, um, I helped him like take around his game to different museums and game nights and things. And it was a huge hit. And then we formed our own company. So it's called Cat Lily Games. And the mission is for STEM themed games, like fun, not like trivia, but fun games that you, the mechanic is built on the concept that you're teaching. So you learn as you go. Um, but after two years at the Science Center, I left there and I went to teach at a public high school here in Virginia. It's called Fakir High School. This is my sixth year of teaching here. And I absolutely love it. It's the most exhausting work it's actually the hardest job I've ever had but it's the most rewarding because I just the relationships with the students and the impact I'm having on their lives um is really overwhelming sometimes and uh it's very fulfilling and so um I teach biology anatomy chemistry AP research um whatever they ask me to teach basically um so that's a little bit about me um, so not only do I design board games, but I, I do have hands-on experience using them in the classroom and not just mine. Like I all use lots of modern board games 
And that's what I want to, to show you really is that how to use popular modern board games that are out there already and how to use them in your classroom. So the outline of my talk, I'll talk about types of learning that you can gain from board games. So there's like abstract learning versus content knowledge, and that's a big debate going on. And then also how to integrate board games into your classroom or like program at the library or how you can support teachers in their classroom. I know our library is very supportive and amazing in the programs they develop that teachers can either go to the library and, and do the stations there or the programs there, or the librarians will come to the classroom and help integrate something there. So um, there's lots of tips and tricks for how to do that. And then also game choice for the classroom. That's very, very important. Um, and so you can't just take any game and, and throw it in the classroom. It has to be kind of either adapted for your time um, or subject, or like it needs to be like scaffolded and like a short enough game. <laughs> so I'll go through all of that when I actually get there, but um, this is the overview of what we're gonna talk about. Okay, so learning type. So for a long time, it's been known that games are more engaging. Um, people have more fun, students are laughing, it's more interesting. Um, but the big debate in the educational world has been like, do they actually teach more effectively? And um, a lot of teachers don't use them because they just see it as chaos and they, they like to have a controlled classroom, like they're big on, they think classroom management is having everyone sit quiet and do their work. Um, but I've actually found that if you do something like that, the kids are more prone to mischief because they're bored. Um, so if they're playing a game, they're actually more engaged. And like, it's actually, for me at least, it's a better classroom management to have people active and doing something. Um, so in the serious play world and board games, it's how do we find evidence that games actually effectively teach the content? And this is also huge because uh, teachers and administrators, we still have standardized tests, at least here, like in Virginia, the high schoolers, they have to pass these tests at the end of the course. So time is very precious. And the tried and true methods of like cramming for the test, people don't like to deviate from that because they think, oh, it's, I'm just gonna play a game, I'm gonna waste time, I can't afford it. Um, whereas that's not actually true. If you can um, incorporate the game effectively, it can be a valuable part of the lesson. So um, that's kind of the holy grail of the serious play world is to convince teachers and administrators that yes, this is actually effective. Yes, you should adopt this as like a, you know, a strategy for your school. Um, and there's been more studies coming out recently, which is really nice to know. And um, I also, so this is my preliminary evidence that I actually did, this is three years ago. So we had a collaboration with Yale University, um, their learning center there. They asked us to create, actually this is a digital game that we made. So we make board games, but the people that work with me, I get interns from George Mason University. I used to be part of their game design institute for three years. And so the game design majors had to do an internship for credit. So a lot of them come to me. Um, and they are programmers, artists, game designers, like the whole gamut. And so we were able to make a digital game that was like a mini game. And so Yale tested it out on one of their summer courses. This is actually for advanced high schoolers. And they had an immunology course and one half of the course did like, there was a class where they had like a little lecture and then a reading in the middle and then a lecture at the end to synthesize things. And the other half of the class had the lecture and then played this game and then had like a little lecture at the end to synthesize things. So um, what they found was that when they used the game, um, people like the more they played the game, the better they did on the test. And that was really reassuring. And um, one thing we didn't get to do, which I really wish we had, 
is test their memory of the concepts like six months later, because I think that like reading and cramming could be really effective for passing a test, but you don't remember any of that stuff. But like, like people will remember stuff where if they have an emotional attachment to the moment, like they're laughing or they're happy, or, you know, they're using all of their senses to engage like um, my hypothesis would be they, you know, they remember that longer. So that's something else I want to do in the future. But um, that's just some preliminary research that we got to do. And I'm trying right now to do it with my board games. And I had a senior student a couple of years ago who took two of my board games into elementary schools and tested them before and after. And his pilot data showed they did actually learn better. Um, so that's, I want, I definitely want to continue that. But it's so abstract games or games in general obviously help enhance brain development and critical thinking skills. But really what I'm I'm trying to focus on is the content knowledge. So, okay, so how do we integrate this into a lesson practically? So the first key factor is time. I think I mentioned this earlier. So time is precious. And depending on your school, you either have like a 45 minute period or I have 90 minute blocks in my school. But I want to be able to play a game in one class period. Um, it just for the efficiency and for sake of, you know, the pacing guide, I need to get this done right away. I can't play like risk, for example, that's going to take me like two or three days. And that's not like efficient for me. So I, that's very, very important. Like what kind of game are you going to choose that will fit? Or how can you adapt a bigger, larger game that's easily um, adapted into that short time frame? So, and then you also, you can't just give your students a game and say, go for it. You have to frame it. The teacher is still a very important part of this process. So the teacher has to frame it with a, like a pre-activity, and a post activity to really like hammer home the message that you want them to get. So for example, um, this is something that I would use in my classroom. I'll have like a pre-game activity kind of to like various things I've tried in the past. So you could do a poll of their previous knowledge related to that topic that you're covering that day, or you could do some vocabulary that they're gonna need to play the game or that will help them learn things from the game. Um, or you could do like a short intro for these concepts, like just like a short, you know, five, 10 minutes of notes or talking about these new things so they can keep that in mind as they play the game. And then they play the game for the bulk of the class period. And then after the game, they will have a like a post game activity. And this is also extremely important. So then you can either just do a discussion of the concepts and you know ask them the questions and everyone talks about things they noticed in the game or things they learned. You could actually do a formal assessment, uh, a summative assessment where you give them a quiz on stuff they should have learned. But I actually don't like to do this so much for a grade because um, there's been some other research showing that if, if they have to play the game for a grade, they don't get as much out of it, ironically enough. Um, if they're just enjoying the game and playing the game and like the stress is kind of lifted a little bit, then they actually internalize things more. So you could do like an informal quiz and just, you know, not for a grade, but something like that. Another thing you could do is like an exit ticket. So before you leave, just answer these, you know, ref reflect upon what you did today and what you learned. Um, and then Actually, it's not on here, but the following day in my classes, I always do a warm up. They're just based on the previous day's activities. So the following day's warm up, you could ask them questions about the concepts from the game. Um, so scaffolded learning is key, key, key. I can't stress that enough. So if you can't just give them a game and expect them to to get what you want them to get out of it. Um, okay. Second factor is motivation. So what, what motivates your particular age group? There's actually the, the link I have on here, it's Quantic Foundry. They are an organization that did a lot of surveys on board game motivation, and they have it divided by like gender, by age, um, all kinds of things. And you can even like do a little quiz on like what your gamer profile is, like 
if you're a social gamer or you want to achieve things or you want to, I think it's called killer, where you just want to like, you know, destroy everybody else in the game and you want to win. Um, there's different things like that where you can see what kind of gamer that you are. But I know like from my students, so I pulled out 13 through 25 because that was the most appropriate for my high schoolers. I know for mine, based on their information, that they they need to win. And this is anecdotally true. My students are very competitive. And um, I prefer cooperative games. That's my favorite kind of game. But, um, and they're okay with it, but they really like games where they can win. And um, for the most part, people aren't like, I have not really bad sports about it. They're just like, ah, like, yeah, you won. Like, I, I haven't really encountered any kind of problem where someone like flips the board or something. Um, but yeah, so they, they need to win. And then the second one is accessibility. So I, my classrooms, they're not gamers. So I have like the regular classes for the most part. And even my like my more advanced classes, like my anatomy class, most people are not gamers. Um, they know like Uno, Monopoly, Clue, like basic things. Um, they don't know about this whole other world of modern board games. And so you can't expect them to have this background knowledge. So it needs to be something they can learn quickly in a few minutes. And that's the tricky part, right? So the teacher can help by kind of explaining the game quickly, or you can reduce the rules so it's easy to learn. I, I'll tell you right now, like whenever I, I hand my kids a rule book and they're, they're just like, no, like they, if they don't get it within like five minutes, they give up, they're just checked out. So it needs to be something that's accessible. Um, immersion, they like storylines, like they'll have fun. Um, but this is like the high school, you know, young 20s group. If you're younger, like on the website, it'll show you younger kids don't really need to win. They like silliness. They just want to be silly and have fun and be goofy. And so it really depends who your audience is. And I know that like um, females versus males is very different as well. Um, so I really encourage you to check out that website. It's very helpful. So know your audience, know your students so you can hit the right marks with them with the games. Um, and then of course, budget. Well, there's no money in education. I think, I think we all know that. Um, so there's various things that I do. So I go hunting at yard sales and thrift stores to try and get um, multiple copies of the game. Uh, I actually I have a lot of different board games in my classroom, but um, they're usually just one copy, which isn't helpful because I have at least 24 kids in my class. So I really need six copies or more to for everyone to play and have a good experience. So I try and get multiple copies that way. Um, more recently, there's been print and play versions coming out, even from these really large board game companies like Asmodee, who makes like Pandemic and Catan and all that. Um, so they'll have like free print and, print and play versions on their website, which is really, really nice. Or you could get sometimes on like Teachers Pay Teachers or other sites, you can get ones like for a dollar or two. Um, so that's really, really helpful. And then, of course, you have to like print it and cut it out or you could have your students help you. Um, but it's definitely a much cheaper way of going than buying all these board games. Um, and then the other thing you can do is adapt existing board games to whatever you want it to be. So let's say you don't have the best, I don't know, biology game, let's see, I don't know, ecology or whatever you're doing. You can take something that exists and kind of put in the ecology flavor or even have your kids do it. And like they could build the game and then play it. Um, so I have some examples of those types of games later in the talk. Um, but yeah, so here's game choices, right? So here's back when this is types of games for general skills. So like abstract thinking. So creativity, memory, strategy, communication, cooperation. These are all really great for that. So all board games in general are good for that, right? So it's hard to find a board game that you wouldn't learn something from, but these are all like, you know, critical thinking skills. One that I absolutely love to use before we do experimental design is this one in the middle on the top. It's called Brainspin. It's a card game and I, I don't know where I found it now. 
Um, I might have found it online, but I probably saw it at a convention and then found it online. But it has these different shapes and um, it really, really, really enhances creativity. So I pass out a stack of cards to each group of four and then um, they'll basically, they'll flip over the top card all at once and then everybody writes down whatever that shape reminds them of. So like it could be like a barbell or a hamburger or lips or something like that. And it's kind of like categories in that you list as many as you possibly can. And then after 30 seconds, I'll say rotate and then they flip the card or rotate it 90 degrees. And so they see it from a new perspective. And it's kind of cool because you're like, oh, it looks totally different now. Well, sometimes if it's a circle, it's not going to look different, right? But um, other shapes would look different. And so then they write down some more. And then when the minute is up, they compare what they wrote. And if you copied, not copied, but if you duplicated somebody else's, you cross it off. And so each unique original answer gets one point. And then you have two more rounds. So three rounds in total. And I've definitely found that when they play this game before they make up their own investigation, because I like to do inquiry-based labs, they're so much better at coming up with unique original ideas for their lab that they're going to design. Um, and it's just really fun. Like it's a, it's a good game to play towards the beginning of the year too. Like it's kind of like an icebreaker in a way because um, there's not, a whole lot of player interaction until you compare answers and then it kind of gets things flowing with the group. Um, so cathedral, I've had this since I was little, but it's good at, you know, it's like space domination on the board. Mastermind, obviously you have to like, you break the code. Um, the mind is a fairly recent game where you're trying to work as a group to lay down cards in order from like one to a hundred without talking at all. So it, it's, it's really weird because it, it sounds impossible, but the more you try, like it is really weird. Like the group will kind of gel and understand each other. It's like the creepiest thing, but it's really cool for like bonding as a group. Um, and then my, my very, very favorite um, kids game, I just think it's genius and just so well designed, is Mole Rats in Space. They've changed the name. It's now Space Escape, but it's a cooperative game and it's anchored to shoots and ladders, so it looks familiar, so it's not scary, but you are trying to get all like your mole rats into this space pod in the middle of the board and launch off before these snakes do. So there's snakes who are coming at you and they can bite you, and if you're bitten twice, like you die. Um, and along the way, the mole rats have to collect four pieces of equipment. Um, so it's really, it's really, really, I can't say enough good things. There's a lot of strategy in the cards and what you're going to do and what you're going to play. And it has these tangible little toy mole rats, which is just awesome because you can put little equipment in your back. Um, so this is designed by Matt Leacock, who designed the pandemic series and Forbidden Island and Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Sky. Um, it's just so well done. And it's like seven, ages seven and up, but I, it's really hard to win. And I, I love it myself. Um, so, okay. Type two is just beyond that abstract, um, is actually getting to content. And you might be familiar with some of these, but um, there's different lines of games that will directly teach a subject. So there's top trumps, which is, they have like, I don't know, hundreds of different kinds of categories. So the ones I show here are wonders of the world, countries, US. It's not just like geography though. Um, and so everyone has a card and there's stats on the card. And then you pick a stat on your card, hoping that it's like the highest for the group. So if like there's six stats and one of them is population and I have like China, I'm going to say, okay, population. And then everyone compares population. And if I'm the highest, then I collect all the cards. Um, but I could pick something else like elevation or whatever it is on the card. And you really get to know, um, uh, like internalize some of these facts in a fun way and then whoever collects all the cards like wins basically and then timeline is really really cool because it's not just history there's a lot of history obviously but um it could be like i think it's animal size and like populations as well so many different categories and you're trying to 
like make a timeline in a way from like biggest to small or smallest to biggest or oldest to newest. Um, and so it's fun and you do for that particular theme, it could be, you know, US history, world history. There's actually, I have one like inventions, which is really cool because it's like science and technology integrated with history and you have to know, okay, what would have come before another thing? Um, there's also like art, languages, all kinds of things. So um, my particular focus is STEM. So I wanted to highlight some STEM games you could play or adapt. Um, so there's um, Organ Attack, which is great. My favorite to play with my anatomy class. It's made by the online comic, um, The Awkward Yeti. And it basically, you have a set of organs and they're really cute. Um, and then you have these cards, these attack cards, which are different diseases. And they're all legitimate diseases with all the medical vocabulary and everything. And then you have to basically try and kill off the other players' organs. So um, it's incredible. They have like, you know, like IBS will show you like which organs you can attack. And then also has these other things thrown in there like um, necrosis, like instant death to somebody's organ, or um, you can play like chart mix up and mix around the cards and you can be, you can play vaccine and prevent yourself from being attacked or medicine to treat yourself. It's really, really fun. And my students have learned so much from it and I've gotten them all addicted to it, even though they're not gamers. Um, there's, so there's photosynthesis, which is a beautiful game and it's like a puzzle kind of, and you're trying to have trees grow and be exposed to the sun. Um, it's not a direct content knowledge game per se, but it like you can, if you're having a photosynthesis like lesson or some kind of ecology lesson, you can adapt it to whatever you're trying to teach. And it's like a nice thing that you could throw in there. Um, that might, so planet below it is wonderful. It has these like little, little soccer ball looking things and they have their little earth. Everyone has a little earth and you're trying to put different biomes on it. Um, and so if you have a, like the most of a certain biome, like forest or desert or something like that, then you get to collect animals that go with that. And so whoever has the most points with the animals they collect wins the game. And like they're magnetic little balls. They're so fun to play with because the tiles just stick right on there and you build your own planet, which is fun. Um, and then there's chemistry flux, which is if you're familiar with flux the base game, it's like a card game where the rules keep on changing all the time which is actually fabulous for um, law students. Like usually <laughs> I talked to some like lawyers the other day and they were asking me, is there a game where the rules change so we can talk about them? Like, yeah, so <laughs> there's Flux and there's all different kinds of themes of Flux. In this case with chemistry, you are putting molecules together, or, sorry, putting atoms together to make a molecule. So not only is it fun because you're like collecting things and building things, but you can actually see, oh, salt is NaCO. Um, the one on the bottom left is Go Extinct. It's a, a cladogram, basically, an evolutionary game. And you're trying to build little clades on the cladogram. And so you can see which animals are related. It's really simple and beautiful and fun and like easy to play in a short time frame. Um, cytosis is actually not good for my as a good game, <laughs> it's just not good for my level of students because it's very complicated and it takes a long time to play. But if you have like AP biology students, I know people that have used that with them or even like undergrads, um, it's really good for them. But like for regular high school biology, it's not, it's not a good use. So it really depends on, on the level of what you're teaching. Um, and then evolution in the bottom right is like you're, evolving your creatures um, to try and out survive everybody. The only one caveat to that is that it's not really natural selection. You're designing your creature. Um, so that's, you kind of have to explain that. <laughs> but, um, it's a really nice, beautiful game. And then I just threw in one of my games. Um, that's like a, it's called Starsmith and you're building stars. Actually, it's a chemistry game, but it's themed with astronomy where your different constellations and you're competing over elements to build your own stars. So those are um, really good to use. 
also, so coding games, if your school is really trying to get across coding, well, Robo Rally has been around like forever. Um, and it's a really like probably the first programming game where you're programming your robot across the board. Um, robot Turtles came out from Think Fun. It's for a very young age group, um, like preschoolers, kindergartners. Um, it's a good game. I will tell you, like for older people, it's not that fun. It's just, it's just, I don't know. It's not as complicated as it would be for fun adult or older kid games, but it is really good for the younger crowd. For the older crowd, Codemaster is really nice. Um, it's not really a game per se, it's more like a puzzle. So you're not competing against anyone else, but you're, you can even work together to solve these little problems with the code. Um, Potato Pirates is super cute. And you're like a boat, a ship of pirates and like these little fuzzy balls are the potatoes and you're trying to launch attacks on each other and you program the attacks. And um, the one in the middle is actually one of ours, it's um, called Tactoe, where you're programming Tic-Tac-Toe to beat the other person. So there's lots of options coming out for coding, which is very, you know, inspiring and nice to see. Um, yes. Would you consider Root kind of a hidden programming game because you're choosing the cards and the order you play them in to? Yes, that's a good point. So that I mean, that's like, like that. that's like very hidden way to get the concepts of coding across. Yeah, and actually, Colt Express is that way too, where you have to kind of program your moves and then everybody plays it out. So you could definitely use those in the classroom as well um yeah that's a really really good point i also have a new game called i haven't played it yet but it's called dive it's like scuba diving and it has these translucent cards in the middle and you can look down and see all these animals but you don't know which level they're on and so you program your dive and like remove these tiles and see did i catch the shark did i not catch the shark so the, like it's a really cool mechanic that um a lot of these other games have in there so that, thank you that's a really good point um so engineering, there aren't as many of these, um, but there are more and more coming out. So across there's like Mousetrap, which you could, you know, do the Rube Goldborn machine. Um, one really popular game from Melissa and Doug is called Suspend. It's kind of like a reverse Jenga in a way where you're trying to balance these coat hanger looking things on this like stand without everything crashing down. And so it's, it's not directly teaching anything, but like it's their, the, the spatial skills and them engineering the structure so that it won't fall down. Like, where can I balance it? What should I do? How can I, like, what shape should I build over here? Um, it's really, really cool. And it's really dramatic because, you know, at any moment it could fall and make this crash and it's very exciting. Um, Engineering Ants is a really super cute game for younger kids uh, where you're trying to build these obstacles for ants to like cross over like I don't know a bridge collapsed or there's like a wolf in the way or I don't know what it is but um there's like a box full of stuff just random cool weird stuff that you can build it with my only thing with that is that is um more based on the user input so if you have kids that are really creative already um then it's wonderful because they'll build the obstacle and they'll explain it and make a story behind it. If you have kids that aren't great at that already, it's not a fun game because <laughs> I once played it and like every time the kids built like a little airplane. Oh, I just flew over. I'm like, okay, can we try something else? Like the airplane is great, but let's try something else here. So um, I best of warning about that one is it really depends on the user. Um, and then I threw one of ours in, it's called Well at Blank. It's a materials testing game where you have these cards, these secret cards about properties of materials like magnetic, sticky, um, bouncy, stretchy, whatever it is. And then you um, draft items from the box that you think match that. And then there's a kit to test them all. Um, so that's like actually fourth grade standards with the NGSS is like properties of materials. So it fits really well into the standards. Um, and then, okay, math, there are so many math games, as you probably know, because math lends itself naturally to games. Um, I put a few here, but there's so many more. So even like Shoots and Ladders, right, is a math game for younger kids. 
math dice is really fun for a little bit older um where you're trying to like roll the combinations that add up to what you want or multiply depending on the game um 24 is used you know in schools nationwide there's actually a tournament based on it where you have a card and there's four numbers on it and you have to figure out like be the first one to figure out how do I get 24 from this like what do I add what do I divide what do I multiply like what combinations could I do that add up to 24 um and then uh I see 10 is like a very like a preschool kind of math game which is fun and then prime climb like you're climbing up like the, when you're landing on prime numbers and reaching the top um so there's lots and lots of math games um, we actually haven't made any math games because I, I know there's so many of them. I'm not sure how to contribute in new way, but there's lots of cute little things you can do. Um, so what I did, so I mentioned a lot of STEM things, but I actually on my website, and I can even give this to Mr. Bergstrom, is um, we have a handout of all different subjects because there's also things for English and PE and we have all the different topics laid out like what games could you use like I know for English um there's a Moby Dick game that's incredible it's so much fun and it really follows the book um like you make choices and and you catch whales and things happen to you and there's characters and you don't have to read the book at all and it's just it's actually really fun you're like whale hunting um there's like I think it's called marrying Mr. Darcy there's a game called, oh gosh, what is it? It's either paperback or a different one. Um, but there's a game where you're looking for, uh, like there's a topic and then everyone has like books around them, like in a library, let's say. And then you have to hunt in your book, a good quote related to that topic. So like love or I don't know, depression or whatever it is. And like you hunt through your book and the first one to find, or maybe like you compare them all and see who has the first one, who has the best one. Um, it's really fun that way. Um, and so there's language games, um, there's social emotional wellness games. So on our website, it's catlily.com. There's articles where I have like our research that we did with the games and just essays that we've written about different topics with games in the classroom. But the teacher resources will have all of that stuff like the handout. And it also has um, some print and plays from us and different things to help you. Um, but yeah, so you could go there for the handout or I can also post it to the in Indiana State Library and. You can have it that way. I am more than happy to help anyone who wants resources or information. This is my passion is using games to enhance education. So that is what I love to do. Um, and so here is my contact, speaking of that. So that's my name um, and my email. And we have a Facebook page, which is Cat Lily Games. I have a Twitter account, Cat Lily 2 and the website. And the hardest part about our information is that there's two L's there and not just one. And so that's a little tricky, but um, it was my co-founder's last name and my first name. So that's what it is. And so I'm also really happy to announce we had a Kickstarter for our, the first game we ever designed. It's like a a strategy card game about life cycles and you're building sets of, of life cycles and they each have different powers depending on what they are. So we just got funded. So I'm really excited about that. Um, just wanted to share. <laughs> so um, that's, that's pretty much what I have. So I'm happy to answer any questions about types of games or my experiences or, you know, troubleshooting things in the classroom or library programs, um, whatever you'd like to know. Perfect. Well, thank you, Catherine. I am going to remind everyone to put your questions in the chat. Um, most of the chat was just super fun conversation about games. Um, <laughs> although we, well, while you were going, although we did have one person ask about the website on one of those first few slides. Oh, the Quantic Foundry? Sure. Is it this one? Um, yeah, so I have the link down there, but you could Google Quantic Foundry there's just a wealth of information on there about, um, and this is from 2017. 
So there might be something newer now. I don't know. But it is really fun to see what your audience would want. And so like if you're a librarian for like a younger school or a high school or, you know, higher ed or, or even just like a public library, like it's kind of good to see what what people are looking for. Sure. And uh, the question, will the recording be available? Yes, that's, that one will definitely be available. Um, I will let everyone know. Uh, someone else asked, if, do you know of any games that teach music? Oh, yes. Well, I, the one I'm thinking of, I think went out of print, but there was one called Compose Yourself from Think Fun, I believe. And you might be still able to get it, but it had uh, like different notes or different stretches of notes. And then you would kind of combine them together and see what worked well, what didn't work well. And you end up making your own like tune. Um, so it could either be like a full out just game or it could be like a direct lesson. Like let's put these things together. What, what you know, what chords can we make? What can we do? Um, it was really interesting. I, I, I heard a rumor it went on a print, but I don't know why <laughs> or if it's still around, <laughs> but it was pretty cool. And I'd never seen anything like that before. So I've dropped a link in the chat for anyone who needs the LEU certificate, but by all means, keep sending your questions. Um, and I will, while we're waiting for some more questions to come in, I will strongly reiterate uh, Catherine's point about timing. Um, I used to work in an academic library and some people have heard this story, um, but we use cooperative games a lot, especially in conflict management courses. And so anyone who knows pandemic and games of that style, you know you can lose really fast. And typically when you're playing, the game is never more than about 45 minutes to an hour. Um, but when you get a group of students trying to play that, especially if they're not gamers and they're business, I don't know if the business students contributed, but it took over four hours to play a game of, I believe it was Forbidden Desert. Oh my gosh, wow. Be because, because they debated to death every <laughs> single person's, every single action. So um <laughs> Definitely keep in mind the time length when you're using a game in any program or class or anything like that. Yes, four hours, Sarah. Um, um, it was pretty. There epic. might be someone tried to use Twilight Struggle to teach about Cold War, like it's a simulation of the Cold War, but that takes forever. Mm -hmm. And so, like, that was not a very successful experience on their part, but yeah. it's a really wonderful game. It's just, sure. you can't really use it. Um, like I've actually know. used, you mentioned pandemic. I, I used that in my anatomy before um, mm -hmm. they can kind of handle it. And then there's a pandemic Iberia, which is you can't, um, you can't actually cure anything because it happens a long time ago. You can only do research on the disease and see what causes it or what might cause it. Um, and so what's really fun is they'll play the game and then when they, it came time for them to, to do research to, to win the game on these different diseases, I actually made them go and do research. And so there was like typhoid and they had to like put together a slide on typhoid or, um, it was really fun and they learned a lot. And like, it was just really neat to see like they actually like did research in real life to win the game. Sure. Uh, we've got a question about suggestions for beginning readers, games for beginning readers. Uh -huh. Well, there's um, Zingo, if you've heard of that. It's like bingo with sight words and it's really cute. And it has these little tiles um, that you place on there. And it's from, also from ThinkFun. ThinkFun is a wonderful company. They have lots of different learning games for different things. They're actually based in Alexandria here in Virginia and they were bought by uh, Ravensburger. Um, and so they're everywhere. And they're just really, really nice. They have a like Zingo. There's um ah, there's another like sight word game like that. I'm not Zingo. I'm blanking on what it's called. Um, but they also have like um laser maze and circuit maze, like strategy thinking games where you have to like create a, a path for these lasers to go through 
and there's different puzzles for that or even making circuits and going through. Um, yeah, so I definitely recommend looking at the catalog for Think Fun. They're wonderful. Great. And we've had a couple of other suggestions in the chat uh, for music games. I've not heard of this one. Plugo Tunes by Sifu. Oh. oh, I don't know that one. No, I don't either. I have to definitely take a look at that. That's neat. Um, and when I was talking about adapting games, so for an, there aren't a whole lot of anatomy games, but like um, I took old copies of Operation that I had, either I bought at yard sales or whatever, and um, each group had to kind of modify the game. So they had made new cards with vocabulary terms, all the medical terms for regions of the body, um, cavities, all kinds of things, directional terms. And then they would play the game where they would, you know, ask the person next to them, okay, which or this organ is, you know, inferior to blah and in the like mental region and all this stuff. And then if they guessed what the object was correctly, they got to try and fish it out with the tweezers. And so it's just really fun because they would, <laughs> there's, you know, there's like goofy things like a bucket and a pencil and a frog and all these things. And so they were like, oh, the frog is, you know, superior to this and proximal to that. It was cute. Yeah, someone's making a suggestion on the beginning reading, looking for language independent games. So that's a, another good route to take. Mm -hmm. uh, Max the Cat, Race to the Treasure, Chunks, Snap It Up and Zingo, Help Foster Decoding Skills, someone else says. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to see. Take a look. Dexterity games. So if you're not looking for a game to explore reading skills for beginning readers, then a dexterity-based game are great because you can just explain the rules and they can get on with the play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cooperative games for young, like the kindergarten set, even preschool from mm -hmm. Peaceable Kingdom, um, which was now bought by Mindware. And Mindware makes a lot of things for like classrooms and, and educational arenas. And they're really, really simple cooperative things, not a whole lot of strategy, but they're so cute. And I think Race to the Treasure is one of them. There's Mermaid Island, um, where you're like, you're these mermaids trying to get to the island before the sea witch gets there or gets you. <laughs> it's like yeah. really simple. Mm -hmm. And then like, Outfoxed is definitely a huge hit um, with every kid I've encountered that's around elementary school age, where it's a cooperative game and you're trying, like this fox has stolen a pie or something, and then you're trying to catch which fox it is before they escape. Um, it's really fun. And it's like, even parents kind of like it. And it's not difficult per se, but it's like, you roll for clues, you make deductions about different features of the fox. It's cute. Great. All right, well, I will kind of do one last call for questions. If anyone has any, and while I do that, I'm going to grab the link for the LEU one last time. For anyone who needs that. Okay, we got a comment here. Just on the word game that might be good for learning word parts, and then they drop a link. So we'll definitely want to check that out. Yeah. yeah uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, yeah, Lisa, you can stop the recording. <laughs>